Hey everybody, thank you for tuning back in. This is Tuesday's Inside Extraordinary. It's William Jones, and we're at the Log Cabin in the Heights again. Uh, today we've got a really special guest for you, and it's going to be Matt with William Henry Knives. I don't know if you've ever been in our stores and seen uh, some of the things that William Henry has, as a company has produced, but they're completely works of art. They do men's jewelry, knives, uh, all kinds of different things with just unbelievable not just the pieces but the story behind each piece the craftsmanship to it and also the materials they use using everything from precious stones dinosaur bones uh, really really beautiful blends of Damascus steels different steels to get some really cool designs so we'll go ahead and bring him in here so this is Matt and we've got you up on the screen there Matt so uh, welcome to our Inside Extraordinary thank you so much for uh, joining us today I can already say you've got some great jewelry on uh, it looks like some of the pieces that you've made on there. So, what? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm always wearing something. Sometimes it's stuff we make, and sometimes it's stuff we might make at some point. Absolutely. That's part of the fun, right? Well, th I uh, but, see. Yeah, but thank you for having. Thank yeah. you for having me. Um, absolutely. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to to be here this, this morning with whoever's out there, and, uh, and obviously you folks at Sissies. We appreciate all the support over the years. For um, sure. But yeah, I'm uh, here at my home office, and uh, it, you want me to do a little sort of quick bio of William Henry? Yeah, background? absolutely. Tell us know. a little bit about the company. All right, let's do it. Um, so, my background is I've been making knives and now a whole lot of other stuff for just over 30 years. I actually dropped out of uh, an Ivy League college back east when I was 19 years old take a job in California at a little backyard knife shop. A couple, three guys making beautiful rustic knives. And I, at that point, I wasn't particularly a knife nut. I just loved the artisanship of what I was seeing. And I loved the timelessness of it. I loved form and function and art and utility and the way that all came together. And that made more sense to me when I was 19 years old and, and studying at a college. Um, so I didn't, I didn't make this pivot to like pursue a career. As I, was, I was a kid for about three years and then I moved to Arizona. Arizona and set up my own shop, converted an old horse barn in the back of a property to uh, to make one of a kind artisan knives, just my hands, my work, my eyes. Um, and then in 1997, I was sort of at that pivot point of do I continue as a craftsman where I've been very successful, but honestly, there wasn't a lot of money in what I could do with my hands. This is generally the case with craft and art. Or do I get hard shoes and go back to school and sort of join the real working world. Um, and right in that moment, I have it to connect with somebody who was a collector of my work as a custom knife maker and who was well healed. Um, and he said, hey, I really love what you do and I'd love to be part of uh, creating rather than just consuming this stuff. And that's how William Henry was born. Um, so I decided not to go back to school and get hard shoes. And uh, William Henry, Henry was the combination of our middle names. So I had the silent partner at startup. Um, there wouldn't be a William Henry without the capital that he infused at the beginning. Um, and my middle name's William. His middle name is Henry. Um, he stepped out of the business uh, over, oh man, 10 or 11, 12 years ago now, maybe. But um, that's kind of how it started. And William Henry was just, I'd been this craftsman, this artisan. I'd had my work. I'd been juried into shows at the Smithsonian and the Philadelphia Museum of Art. I was 25 years old. Um, so I was not a very accomplished artisan early. Um, and the question was, can I do that? That integrity, that soul, that warmth, that high touch, that sort of timelessness of, of form meets function at that point in terms of uh, only a knives, can I scale that? Can I keep everything that I love about it, but not have it just be my hands and my eyes? Can I use technology? Can I figure out ways to train some of these skills and broaden, um, actually build a brand, build a company instead of just me, you know, with the 200 knives that I could make by hand a year, which is obviously really small. So that was 97. And we fast forward all the way till now. And uh, at least pre-COVID, which COVID has thrown a wrench into uh, most small businesses and probably your business as well, Sissies, but certainly um, all these small brands, William Henry included, uh, pre-COVID, we were at about 42 employees. In about 
nine or ten thousand square feet total in Oregon. So we've got a jewelry shop, we've got a knife shop, we've got a pen shop, we've got our office and admin, um, and we're producing, you know, by, without question, much more refined and beautiful stuff than I was able to do in my mid twenties as an artisan, and that just comes from all of these years of focus, 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 keep setting the bar higher, keep imagining new ways we could do stuff, um, new materials that we could find and play with. So that's a really brief uh, a little intro to the backstory of William Henry. Yeah, it's always a cool thing to see when an artist is able to scale up not only their designs, but their craftsmanship and just how well the quality of your knives and everything that we do have, and not just the knives, I mean like the jewelry that you have on, uh, and it's really something that a lot of our customers have bought into. It's not just the, you know, one knife looks cool. It really is the brand that you've put on, the design that goes through everything. And then uh, it's a really, really cool style there, too. So we really appreciate it. I mean, it's awesome Thank having you, you on. You. Really cool hearing the journey that's on there. Uh, I've got a few images on here. If you want to go through and just, I think that'll be the easiest way to, kind of lead into this so let's pull up uh, this first image and this I wanted to show this one first because this is when you see this and you don't understand how knives are made this looks it's not even comprehensible to me to how you even make a piece like this I mean so I mean all I really know I see Damascus steel I see the mother of pearl on there I see the different metals that are on there so I mean how do you even start to make a knife like this um, well, you make sure you got a bottle of Jack Daniels at the ready. <laughs> yeah. and that's sort of your first step. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we can relate to uh, that. Um, so, I, so I'll go. I'll go through this really quick because there's um, uh, there's a, with each material, right? With each technique, and not just the design and the and the final product. There's sort of a backstory. There's a how we got there. Um, and this is a really good example. So this is a brand new B5. Um, I've been, the B5 uh, has the, it's called, broadly is called the Monarch. And I've been, I, I designed the B5 way back in like 2003, 2004. But this is a brand new iteration of this where for the first time, I did a double bolster handle. So you've got metal sort of showing front and back on the handle. And that's just something we've released in the last three weeks. Um, but Let's just go through it piece by piece. So the blade is what we call wave Damascus. And for this Damascus, this was me working with one small um, metallurgical outfit in Japan to create a 55 layer laminated steel that has a core metal that's an incredible edge metal. So that the actual core that meets the edge, always meets the edge, is hard. It, holds an amazing edge. It's, it's 67 Rockwell. It's an extraordinary cutting steel. And then the, the exterior layers that sort of sandwich into that and are then patterned that are softer, and that gives the blade tensile strength. So you've kind of got the best of both worlds. But anyhow, that was me working with a small metal shop in Japan who had the ability to laminate these disparate metals really interestingly, and then developing patterning techniques with them. So. If you go out into the knife world um, now in kitchen cutlery and some other places, you'll see this look. Um, but the look was actually 16 years ago, me going to Japan three times and figuring out how to take what they could do and mix it with the forging and patterning technology out of the US Damascus making tradition um, to bring this to life. So we've been doing it for a long time and it is now wide copied although very rarely in materials this fine because that that edge material is extraordinary so that's just the blade the handle is Mokume Gane and this, this is forged by a guy in Ohio and it's 89 separate layers of brass copper and nickel silver that are fused together and originally each of those layers is almost an eighth of an inch thick 89 layers so you're talking about a stack of metal that's like nine inches tall to begin with and that is forged and forged and folded over on itself and every time it has to be heated up red hot you have to be really careful with temperature and, and just basically compressed and compressed and compressed so that those layers become microscopically thin but they're all there once you have, have it then you're using patterning techniques to create that sort of raindroppy swirl pattern 
that emerges through the material. So it's 89 separate layers of these of brass, copper, and nickel silver. Because we've done so much work with this material, and we're this guy's biggest customer, and we have been for 20 years, because um, it's a guy. This isn't some big company. It's a guy. His name is Mike Sackmar. He makes this material for us, just him. Um, uh, I don't know any big companies that are making material at this level. Um, but as we played with it, we spent a lot of time figuring out the finishing techniques to really reveal that pattern as beautifully as it can be. Um, so we do a lot of, uh, there's like a, probably a 32 step process that we do in our shop just to reveal the pattern that way. It's like, oh, it's really cool. But to get it to look that cool, to really get everything that's possible is sort of this trial and error. And we do that with every material that we use. Um, the inlay is Mother of Pearl. A lot of people know Mother of Pearl. Uh, it's beautiful. It comes from the South China Sea. It comes from the Indian Ocean. It comes from around Australia. Um, this is the same shell that you would use to cultivate or would naturally cultivate in the world real pearls, real, real white sea pearl. Um, but the actual shell is thick enough that we can get these beautiful cross sections and the pictures never do it justice. It's why you have to see them in person. Hopefully it's this is, is there's an iridescence. There's a blues and greens and pinks that reveal and there's a depth to this material that I've, I've been a fan for as long as, I mean, for as long as I've been making nine. And then we finish it with sterling silver with, with uh, tempered stainless fittings and then two sapphires set into the button lock and the, saf and the, uh, and the thumb stud. So it's, it's a lot of work, a piece like this from start to finish is if we're lucky eight months, more often 12 to 14 months. So we're constantly putting things in play right now that aren't going to see the light of day until summer 2021. And that is how long this stuff takes to do. It's there. There is no. I've never figured out a quicker route. So, well, it is absolutely. I mean, we got some formative. Yeah. It is wonderful. Yeah, that is definitely. I mean, that's a that kind of blew my mind there. I mean, I hear a lot of the you know talking points and kind of the design aspects of it, but that was that's fantastic. Uh, hey, we're getting a little bit of lag in it, Eric. Is there any way you could pause your video, and I'm going to pause my video also. Could you go up onto the top here, onto the, uh, let's see, go to the window zoom onto the left. Let's see, Eric, can you turn your, there we go right there. That should help out a little bit. That should be fine there. Uh, and let's go on to the next piece. So we had on, on this, so is it something, I know you do a lot of different, each piece is designed off of a certain series, if I'm not speaking out of turn onto it. And so, uh, That's right. Where, are these just things that the, the metal becomes available? I know you've done it with meteorite, with dinosaur bone, with all kinds of different things. Are those just really things that you're intrigued by, that you really, how do you come up with these? Well, so the world of, um, of artisan knives is a strange little world, and that's the rock that I, that I came from, right, or came up, yeah. out from under. And a lot of these, Materials are out there, but in really small ways. Um, and I love, I love, obviously I love integrity over time. If the material won't hold up, I'm not interested. I love story. Um, I love visual. Um, so what I'm always looking for, what I love about things like meteorite and lapis and dinosaur bone and some of these craziness materials that we love to use is they connect us all. Right? They're like, a, we have a shared history. I don't care where you're from on the planet, what your political persuasion is, it doesn't really matter. Dinosaurs are dinosaurs, that's just cool. And, the abil and our ability to actually occasionally obtain 100 to 300 million year old petrified dinosaur bone and bring that to life in something that you can actually own and carry and pass down to your kids, um, that's just fun. Now within dinosaur bone. Um, a lot of it is relatively, uh, it doesn't look like much. It's dinosaur bone, but it kind of looks like concrete. That's not interesting. But every now and then, you get these extraordinary colors and are created. This is 100 million years in the ground, wherever it was, and you get this beautiful pebble pattern. So um, I love these di different materials and I love being able to tell the story and it inform whoever's interested enough that they can tell the story because it's a great story. It's not just, oh yeah, 
it's diamond. I had no problems with diamonds. Um, but this is a lot more intriguing, and honestly, there's a lot less of it. Well, I feel really fortunate that with a lot of these meetings, some of these fossil materials in particular, um, the really big brands out there, and we're not a big brand, um, have either can't be bothered to work with it because it's never easy to work with, um, and you get a lot of fallout and scrap, and you can't really predict when you're working with these materials how it's going to go, um, and or um, they just haven't bothered. Because as soon as they did or do, all of a sudden there's no supply out there. It's not like there's an infinite supply of dinosaur bone ready to go or genuine meteorite that fell to earth and didn't, um, and didn't become you know, molten dust. Um, so luckily, the, the prices keep going up, but we're constantly looking out in the world for who's out, out there. And again, it's not big companies, it's individuals that are They've made their life's work figuring out where this stuff is and where it can legally be found um, and harvested. And then so we've just got this dance and this network and we're always calling and emailing saying, hey, we're kind of looking for it. And if you find, and that's this, it's 20 plus years of developing those relationships around the world to be able to, not on a systematic basis, but periodically say, hey, we just got X and now we can make this really cool thing with it. And a year later, we finally they were able to make it. That's this constant dance. So, um, but yeah, do you want me to just speak really quickly about the next piece you're showing? Yeah, you? let's go. That's that's absolutely. I've always wondered how you were able to find all these uh, pieces onto it, and this is a uh, so this is very different. So before we had, and forgive me if I pronounce it incorrectly, but we had Mott Gandhi. Was that the the Makume Gandhi? Makume. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that was the design that you had inside of or in the knife here and now we're going to more of yeah. almost like a carved uh let's see with this one go back mm -hmm. to it yeah. this is a car yeah, so this is yeah um so this guy th there's kind of a couple basic approaches and i i always like to um to, to me first build a great design and build a great product right and then you can trick it out to the end of the earth but you built a great product so under Underneath it all, it's not smoke and mirrors. It's a great pocket knife, it's a great pen, it's a great whatever it is. So you can create value by, like with Mokume, it's the forging of the metal. It's the incredible craftsmanship of that versus applying a decorative treatment onto. And so in this case, we're looking at this frame, which is the, this is also another version of the, of the B5 Monarch, but this frame, all of that work is hand chisel, hand chisel carved sculpted sterling silver and each component is created and soldered in place onto that base german silver frame so this is sort of a more traditional you're applying art to a surface as, as opposed to the art is the actual surface in the case of forged metal so it's beautiful workmanship um again this looks like it's a little hard to tell but those are either sapphires or blue topaz set into the stones this inlay is natural lapis lazuli, um, and that is, um, we actually, to get the quality of, of stone bone and the quality of finish that we want, we work with a company in Germany who ultrasonic cuts that, lazu that lapis really? lazuli for us. Um, so we do all of the hand finishing and all of the detailing, but the actual lapis lazuli is all the way from Germany because we could get the precision that we needed in a stone that's difficult to work with. And then the blade is, in this case, this is hand-forged Damascus. So three different metals, uh, hand-forged by a guy in Alabama, Chad Nichols, super amazing guy, amazing forger. And he figures out how to forge these metals, which we sort of specify, hey, we'd like to use these metals to make sure we get beautiful visuals, but also great corrosion and resistance and a blade that cuts really well and sharpens really well. Um, so in this case, you're looking at more like anywhere from 110 to 140 layers of these three different steels compressed all the way down into a blade that's less than an eighth of an inch thick. So wow. you, it's, the reveal is beautiful and with a hand forge, every, every single piece is different. So we can make, you know, over time, 500 blades that we call this steel from Chad Nichols but every single one of them will have its own mm -hmm. unique pattern. 
That is because of the nature of how it's made. That's it's like the anti-commodity luxury. Yeah, right? it's, <laughs> exactly. It's no two pieces are alike, and we love that. And uh, I, I want to say, I mean, I've seen a lot of people carry your knives with them every single day. I don't think I've ever seen one actually damaged. I mean, that was the the stones that you use, the metals, everything. I mean, they're incredibly durable. Well, that's you know, that's um. Well, thank you for saying that, and because one of the things that I this is what I do, right? So one of the things I've dealt with for thirty years is too pretty to use. Yeah. Right. There's that instinct of wow, that's cool, yeah. but it's too pretty to use. And you're speaking exactly to that. It's again, it's it's a smoke and mirrors question. We build a great, great knife. When I set out, I, my the original William Henrys were not fancy, because I knew that if I built a great knife that would last for generations that was my credibility that was my foundation and once i really had that then i could trick it out i could upgrade the materials i can find these amazing techniques that are equally durable but underneath it all is you can do whatever you need to do with it whatever you would use a pocket knife for this will do it and probably do it better than than any knife you've had because of the grades of materials yeah. and the craftsmanship that we use um and it looks like that. Exactly. Um, it's, it's not an either or. That's what it's I was going to say. Or. Is it pull up the next picture here? But any all of the designs to it, it's that basis. Like you're saying, that basis design of the knife looks extremely durable. And then from there, it's upgraded with materials that not just look great, but every single one of them is extremely durable. Yeah. So what we? Yeah. I, well, the only thing I would, my only caution to that is the only time we, I won't say the only time, but almost. The only time we see um, knives that are damaged is when people make the mistake or need to really use them as pry bars, right? Yeah. And a lot of people have this association with, oh, I dig in the dirt and I break open cans and all of that. Well, most knives, not most, well, many knives are made very thick with very thick edges. Those work as a pry bar, but they're not that great as a knife because a knife is a cutting instrument. So I'm all about the cut. Right, which is to say, you could you could put this through anything you could imagine, and when you make the step to say, oh, now I'm going to use it as a screwdriver, right? Yeah. <laughs> it, we it may come out okay, but that's not what I'm building. I'm building not something that can be a pry bar and kind of a cutting instrument. I'm building a really extraordinary cutting instrument, and so all of the geometry is designed for for that. But in any case, they're certainly durable enough um, for any application of a cutting instrument. So. Okay, so the next knife. Um, uh, it's interesting, we're, we're rolling through a number of different B5 models here. Um, so this is another one. This guy, um, I told you in the, on the last knife about the Lapis Lazuli uh, um, and the, the German uh, company that does ultrasonic cutting. They also, they also do three-dimensional ultrasonic engraving super fine. I mean, you think about German engineering and German cars and that, right? It's, it's the technical aspect and the detail is extraordinary. So for us to be able to work with these guys, this is pure jade. Yeah. Super high grade jade in the end. Another extremely and durable. They had this tech, right, right. This technical precision was extraordinary to work with them and to marry our, our artwork into that technical precision through this ultrasonic engraving was the thing. It's it's really slow, it's not fast, and obviously in jade, it's not cheap. Um, and they only do a handful of pieces, but that inlay is a dragon, ultrasonically, three-dimensionally carved over time, over, you know, it's something like 10 hours in this, in this one machine just for part, um, ultrasonically engraved into this jade that is then inlaid into a mosaic Damascus which is a process of forging metal where instead of just forging a big piece, you're forging tiles um, that sort of have a radial pattern to them of some kind and then recombining those tiles. So it's even a more complex version of Damascus steel in the frame. Um, we've got black spinel uh, set into the stones, uh, into the into the two things. It looks like black diamond. Um, it really does. Uh, it's mm -hmm. just more reasonably priced than black diamond, but it yeah. gives us that look. And then again, another hand-forged Damascus blade from a different guy. This guy's North Carolina. His name's Mike Norris. This is his pattern called Hornet's Nest. He's the only one in the world that does that pattern. 
um, because he's developed his own art. Uh, he's been forging for 40 years now, um, and I've been happily bu buying um, billets of steel from him for, well, I mean, he might have been the first Damascus maker I ever worked with at William Henry, so at least 20, 21 years now. So That's fantastic. Well, let's yeah. go. And again, I just want to say, I mean, the, the, the gems and the stones that you picked are just unbelievable. I mean, jade is one of the most durable Jade and lapis are extremely durable. The designs go great. The colors, yeah. it's fantastic. And yeah. I want to go on here. I think the next one is Thank jewelry. You. Is this a bracelet? Yes, a leather bracelet and some yeah. different things in here. And then, yeah. like like you said, the design, not just in the knives, but in the jewelry, is durable, craftsman. It still has the art behind it, too. And tell us a little bit yeah, about so, the class. Yeah, well, the, that's always... Sure. Yeah, yeah. So this is um, this is one of I think we released this sometime late last fall. Um, this is an eight millimeter uh, braided leather, and we have the, the the leather is custom braided for us. We actually we don't just buy some braided leather off the shelf because well that would be easy, and we don't like to do things <laughs> the easy way. So we actually choose the hide, um, the the actual leather and the hand sort of the feet heel and the, the texture that we want and then we work with a braiding company to braid it with a sort of a closed edge to our spec so it's it's worthy of the William Henry brand mm -hmm. um, and so that's so really it's it's a bangle around the wrist obviously the focal point is the clasp so we designed it took us a little while but we designed a clasp that has a double lock king system so it's got double rare earth magnets that lock it together but then that sort of that clear top bar you can call it that you see on the picture yeah on one side of it it actually has sort of a, a, a reverse angled hook that drives down into the clap uh, that drives down into the other side so these this pattern is contiguous when you put it together and when you're wearing it it looks like one piece it's beautiful uh, because the pattern runs right through that seam but then it actually has this double locking system um, so it's not not just magnets that are holding it together it's also got this cross hook that keeps it really secure and with this kind of work um, we're designing and engineering and we're refining that class in sort of its raw form until we really get it exactly the way we want it to look at the right weight and all of that and then i'm working with in this case um, an engraver of all places in new jersey Really? Okay. Uh, this, this, guy, I, this guy's name is Alexi, and he is, God, he's got to be in his mid-60s, and he's been an artist, an extraordinary artist since he was 20, kind of like me, but even with more history. We give him these raw pieces, uh, and we work with him, and he develops artwork concepts, and then does super deep relief engraving in that master, yeah. uh, based on the artwork that we agree on, um, that that's sort of overblown and really deep and in a piece like this the original master engraving will have something like 80 hours That's just to be engraved tell. for this one, this one master but he understands what we're then going to do and that gives us the ability to then create and mold and cast and repeat that pattern over time yeah. and obviously do a lot of hand finishing in our shop but it's a, it's a beautiful simple thing and because it's this one clasp and this really clean look it's it's timeless um, without being you know crazy over the top expensive. So it's been really successful, and I'll say to you and to um, to the people that are, are tuned in, we're really excited that this is part of our we call it a leather collection. So we've got a range of leather-based jewelry that that this is a piece of, and with all of these sort of the six core pieces of this collection, and they're um, so they're different applications on the neck and wrist but based on leather is the sort of the core material that holds mm -hmm. them together. We're just about to launch a new collection that's really, we're calling, calling it Americana. So the artwork uh, with every piece is really new. It's stars and stripes, it's eagles, it's, um, it's sort of the iconography um, that celebrates our American heritage. Um, so I'm excited. So there will be this piece but completely re-rendered in that style. And we should be, it should be, uh, sissies, you should be seeing it within, um, 
I think in the next 30 days, we've actually been working on We'll be on excited. It we're so getting we're uh, more and more requests for it. So, mm -hmm. especially, I love the leather, and the, like you said, the clasp is unbelievable. And then uh, the beaded bracelet, is that the one that is next here? The There we go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so... Both so of we these have are a lot of different beaded stuff. This is really clean. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say it's always a masculine design. That's one of my favorite parts about it. Is that it match? It's jewelry that you would get from a knife maker and not a uh, jewelry maker. I mean, it's it definitely tells. It, it's it's very cool. Well, that was a big part of it. Um, is you know we come from the sword. We come from the knife. That's our deep. That, Oh, I'm sorry. I think it was just it's a got a weird echo. Yeah. Okay, it's better. Um, uh, so taking that original DNA and bringing it across to jewelry is going to create a range of jewelry that's really distinctive because we're not coming at it as a jewelry designer, as a fashion designer, as a women's brand that's making some stuff for men. It's really got at that core masculine DNA and. You know, women love this jewelry too, and they wear it remarkably well. But the intention was to expand the range of options more um, for men, because I feel like women have a lot of options in terms of how they adorn themselves, and we as men don't have that name. So William Henry is about that in a variety of ranges. So in any case, this bracelet, that center bead that grabs your attention, that is super high grade dinosaur bone. So that's as good as it gets. Yeah. That's about a hundred million year old Apatosaurus from the American Southwest. Uh, Utah, sometimes New Mexico, occasionally Nevada, Arizona. But this really high red color is the most rare of the dinosaur bone. Uh, but obviously it makes it's this extraordinary centerpiece. And then we've got some sterling accents and a sterling clasp. And we're just using a flat finished onyx surround. And the whole thing is built on braided stainless aircraft cable. Really? With welded seams. So it's not like on a cord that's going to break. It's really like, how does this... Uh, how do we create that same level of integrity in our jewelry that we, we expect of our knives, which is that it will last for generations. So that's the substructure on it. Well, that, that's a, I mean, this is men's jewelry also. That's one of my favorite things about it is that, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, here I, we're in Arkansas, we're out a lot, and we're doing things outdoors. It's not so, I don't want to wear something that was designed for somebody to wear downtown in L.A. I want to wear something that, if I'm going to wear it, you know, it represents kind of, a little bit more masculine look and a little it's always the stories behind it being able to say hey this is you know aircraft aluminum gray or this is aircraft gray with the dinosaur it's it's a lot of really cool designs to it. let's go yeah yeah we uh, uh, we, we us, uh, guys like the, the stories yeah exactly that's that's what you want to be able to sell let's go on here let's go to the next and then the cufflinks here yeah I love this. Yeah, super simple. clean, elegant design. You know, I, I just wanted to strip them down to the essence. Um, so they're they're big and bold without being too big. Big and bold, um, solid one piece, sterling silver, beautifully finished, nice and heavy. Um, and in this one, uh, they're inlaid with a sort of a cross cut red tiger up. Right, so more of a traditional gemstone that you would think of. Mm -hmm. um, but it's beautiful, and then we do these same cufflinks. We'll do them in meteorite, we'll do them in labradorite. We're working on them in dinosaur bone, mammoth tooth, and all of these different things. Um, but yeah, they've been, it's been nice. We've been dabbling with cufflinks for a while. This particular design, this really clean square, uh, but beautiful finishes, um, big enough without being too big, has, has really resonated. I me. always... Well, it's great it's, to see, because I just... What's that? Oh, no, I was going to say, well, the coolest thing about your designs is that not... Not only can you carry it every day, but it, I mean, it's almost like tuxedo quality. It's like a James Bond uh, knife and jewelry wear. That's what I love. Pull up the money clip also. I mean, the if you have the knife, the money clip, and the bracelet, whether you're, uh, you know, whatever you're doing, whether it's going somewhere out of the city or going to a tuxedo event, it's truly, uh, really that James Bond jewelry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's it. Well, we, you know, Pierce Brosnan was one of our early fans and continues yeah. to be, so we do, in fact, have at least one of the J yeah. <laughs> James Bonds in our, uh, uh -huh. in our relatively immediate circle. Yeah, he, yeah. he used William Henry in a couple different movies he made. Not the James Bond ones, but 
some independent films yeah. just because he loved William Henry. So, cool. um, in any case, this uh, yeah, this money clip. This is a new design. We, it's called the M4. There's some other name for it, but I can't keep it all straight. But um, it was super clean design, and, and so th this frame is what we call wave mokume. So it's it's once again working with a small different metal shop in Japan, <laughs> and working with them to use a nickel silver and a pure copper and a pure iron in a, in a sort of a mix of metals that they'd never done before, but they had the technology to do when then patterning that. Then we use heat. And what's really cool about the heat is heat doesn't affect the nickel silver. Heat just slightly reddens the copper, but depending on the temperature you use, heat really changes the iron component. So you can get browns and blues and purples interspaced with these these copper tones and these white tones and so the other two metals. So that is what we call our wave mokume. It's our proprietary product. Um, this one is inlaid with a really beautiful piece of desert ironwood burl. Super high grade desert ironwood is one of the three woods in the world that's so hard and heavy naturally that it just sinks in water. Really? They won't float. It's one of those cool things. Um, and then you can kind of see the back, but the back is a really, it's a black, it's a black PVD finish. So it's like a black diamond coating onto a tempered stainless clip. Um, and then and sort of there's these three screws up towards the top of the, of the money clip that, that work really beautifully in the design, but actually lock it all together. Because everything we do, everything we do, we've got to be able to put together and take apart multiple times to get all of these different finishes to be completely seamless in a final product. So there's always micro threads happening, which allows us mm -hmm. these sort of different steps to end up with something that's seamless, but has all these disparate materials happening together. So, I mean, very cool, holds as much as almost anybody would want to carry. It's almost, I, when you go and actually pick one of these up, especially that money clip, I absolutely love the design. It, like I've said before, it does not look like it was made of this world. It looks like something that would come out of a uh, sci-fi because it's just so hard to imagine, uh, you know, a person being able to make something like that. It's absolutely fantastic. And then this next piece is my favorite because if there's anything I would well, say, thank you, thank you for saying. Yeah, if there's anything that I would say about you know not just your company but your designs, it is what the uh, the coolest top tier pieces that you could have and then you've actually leveled them up from that so i love to play golf and it, the divot tools that you've made and the different pieces to it are just fantastic i haven't seen this piece yet but uh it, it's a divot tool yeah. i can't see the the tv's a little bit further away here but is that mother of pearl on the handle or on the frame yeah 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 um so i had dabbled in divot tools about 15 years ago and then got distracted by other projects and i was digging through our back storage area and i found a couple prototypes of this design from 15 years ago that i'd never yeah. done anything with and i and i looked at them and i played with them and i was like well that's awesome what was i thinking so it was finally time then we had to sort of go back and figure out all over again how would we make Make this, but yeah, that's mother of pearl, and the entire body, um, the whole thing, is made from one piece of aerospace grade titanium. Really, that's real, and I don't know. It's not aluminum. That's not stainless. That's yeah, titanium. Yeah, same that's... titanium you would use in a in a hip replacement. I mean, it's really? it's all that. The coolest yeah. one you had the one it was a switchblade divot tool with the ball marker on it. Uh, and it was it was copper. I, never, I remember it was my favorite. We ended up selling it, and I always, of course, I was so much younger, but I always joked around saying, "Hey, I want this," you know. But it was just absolutely fantastic being able to see it, man. Well, well that's all the pieces I had, and Matt, I can't thank you enough for coming on. Uh, we had a little bit of video difficulty, but we recorded it, and that if it's messed up on the live stream, it'll be reposted. But, uh, I mean, easily, thank right. you. You've made this so easy. Definitely the best guest we've had so far. And really great being able to put a face with uh, a lot of the designs to it, too. And so I'll definitely uh, have to go down or order some pieces from you because just meeting you, uh, not just seeing the designs and everything, has really, really elevated the uh, William Henry brand to me. So thank you so much for coming on. All here. right. Well, well, of course, man. Well, I, I appreciate it.
Is it William or Bill? We it's it's William. Yeah, I just see William Jones then. Okay, yeah. William. But it's a good name, by the way. As I am. Yeah, I guess it's yeah, uh, starting uh, off there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. It being my middle yeah, sir. Full name, long family heritage there. Mm -hmm. Liz, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. And, um, you know, if you want to... Uh, circle back and do another thing like this in the future just just pick we'd it. love to i mean after seeing some of the things like this we might get on something yeah. that's not live that we can do a little bit easier over a single or a couple pieces or something like that but i really appreciate